Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. You meet someone online and there's this instant connection. It's amazing how much the two of you just seem to click. They live somewhere far away, and there's some plausible reason they can't travel to meet you. They tell you they're in love with you, and you feel optimistic for the first time in a long time. They have a successful career, yet somehow they need money from you to solve a short-term problem, always with the promise of paying you back. Time goes on, and they need more money more urgently. You've started to see the cracks and begin to wonder whether they've been lying this whole time. All of a sudden, it hits you. You've been scammed. Fool Me Twice is the story of my mother, Jules Hannaford, a woman who was drawn into the dangerous world of sweetheart scams. After a trip overseas to meet a stranger, a dangerous altercation in a Manchester hotel room, and thousands of pounds lost for good, she's here to tell her story. Fool Me Twice, a true crime podcast, is available on Apple Podcasts, Ozcast Network, and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Today I'm here with Sue Toomey. Hi, Sue. Thanks for joining me today. Hi, Jules. Thanks so much for having me. It's so exciting to have you here. I listened to your podcast with Regina on Hashtag Impact a long time ago, and I've been wanting to get you on my show. So thank you so much for coming along. My pleasure. Tell me a bit about Hands on Hong Kong and what you do. Yes, Hands on Hong Kong. We are a local charity focused on empowering everyone in Hong Kong to volunteer. So what we do is provide meaningful opportunities for really anyone to roll up their sleeves and do some kind of volunteering. So we're supporting both the volunteers, but we also work with and partner with around 100 local nonprofit organizations who do everything from helping the homeless to educating children to working with isolated elderly and so forth. And we co-develop programs with them and recruit and manage volunteers, or many times they'll have their own programs and they just need a steady stream of volunteers and we can help provide that for them. How many different charities do you work with? I think our latest count was 104. Oh my gosh, Mm -hmm. that's a lot. There's a lot of charity work going on in Hong Kong, isn't there? There is. You know, I think there are more than 9,000 registered charities in Hong Kong, believe it or not. Most of them focus, I should say, on Hong Kong itself. Others kind of use Hong Kong as a bit of a fundraising hub, and then the money goes to other markets. So we at Hands on Hong Kong, we focus really only on the organizations that support the local Hong Kong community because one in five people in Hong Kong are living below the poverty line. So there is significant need right here at our doorstep that a lot of people don't even know about. See, that's so interesting because we see Hong Kong as such a rich city. So I wouldn't have realized that one in five people are living below the poverty line. That's exactly right. That's a big statistic, isn't it? It is. It is. And I always say, you know, kind of the bubble that is Hong Kong, because it's very easy to live in a bubble in Hong Kong. And I certainly was a bubble dweller for many years until sort of really changing my role and joining Hands on Hong Kong and getting out more into different neighborhoods and different areas that just my life didn't have reason to bring me to before. And I don't say that with any judgment of people who aren't aware because you just wouldn't be. And in your day-to-day life, you wouldn't find that. But Well, it's almost like it's so well hidden, isn't it, in Hong Kong? Like it's not like in some cities where you can see a lot of homeless people on the streets or you're very aware of the poverty. I mean, I know we've got the cage homes. Yep. Very difficult living conditions for people. Do you work in that area at all, supporting people in caged homes? We support, we work heavily in the people living on the streets. Right. So there are some wonderful organizations. I know there's one called SOCO, a large one and a very well-funded one. And they do 
fantastic work supporting people living in the caged homes. We work closely with Impact Hong Kong. Yeah, um, Jeff Rotmeyer has been on my podcast already. We yeah, love that's Jeff. Homeless in Hong Kong. That's episode, like about episode 25 or something. <laughs> fantastic. So we've been working with him really since he started. And he was, you know, first doing a walk with just himself as an individual. But once he started to get more formalized and official and needed more support, not recruiting volunteers because there was plenty of interest, but he wouldn't know on any given day if he was going to have 50 people showing up or five. And so we met with him and he said, you know, I would like to just take the whole, you know, recruiting and management of the volunteers from the sort of logistics capacity off my plate. So he can focus on what his mission is, which is supporting the homeless. And so it's been a great partnership in that regard that we've really been able to offload a lot of that admin work. So for example, on any given day of the week, we have a kindness walk on our calendar. So that means that we're able to recruit and manage the volunteers for him. We send out all the communications. We send reminders. If there's a weather or other event in Hong Kong that may preclude people from getting to where they need to go, whatever that might be, you know, we have dedicated people on our staff who are regularly communicating with the volunteers going on a kindness walk. They get a thank you note from us afterwards, and then we report all of the statistics back. So that's really a capacity building area that we can provide to an NGO partner like an impact or others that would otherwise maybe take them a full staff member to do. And how many volunteers might you have on your books in total for all of your charities? We have a little over 22,000 on our books. 22,000. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh, I thought you were going to say like 5,000. That's incredible. Yeah, they're not all active at the same time. No, <laughs> sure. But, but still, would, that's yeah. a lot of people in Hong Kong willing to give back, which is really nice. That's exactly right. I think there's a great desire and intention to do good. I think what happens is, like everyone in Hong Kong, we just get busy. and Life really, gets in the way. Life gets in the way. And, and we prioritize, you know, maybe time with family or time working or traveling or doing other things. And so what we're trying to do at Hands On is to say, you know, it might just be two hours on a Saturday morning. You know, you don't have to change your life for it. And some other things we're doing is, you know, if people want to spend time with family on the weekend, we're trying to create more and more opportunities for younger people to get out and volunteer. And, you know, I think that's such a good thing because I think giving back and making a difference in the community can be great for your self-esteem. So for young people who struggle with stress or anxiety or pressure of school and academics and things like that, giving back to the community can be a great way of doing something for your own well-being. Would you agree? I agree wholeheartedly. If I can add to that, we were at a workshop developing a youth empowerment program where we want to have young people creating programs, understanding the needs, creating the programs that other youth could come and volunteer. And so we went around and talked to a number of different teachers, those running CAS programs, or just sort of the student volunteering. And what was really great, because we wanted to get a little bit of the insight from the student perspective or what teachers were seeing from students as well. And it was that in Hong Kong, there is kids' lives, there's so much control over kids' lives. There are often overbearing parents who are making high sure, expectations. Super high yeah. expectations. And so if you're not at school, you're at an after school activity, you're having tuitions, you're at a violin lesson, you're at a sports camp. You know, there isn't a lot of time where kids are just their own or that they can make their own decisions about what they're doing. So in some ways, volunteering activities where kids, you know, youth in particular, can break out of the house, maybe go with a friend or go with a group of friends and do something for a couple hours where there's the buck stops with them. They need to deliver that bread. They need to pick up that trash or on the beach, whatever it is. You know, it can be something simple or it can be more involved. It could be tutoring younger refugee students. So there's lots of activities that youth can do. But when they're the ones in charge and there's no one really telling them what to do, and particularly not a parent or a teacher, you know, that's really empowering for them. So they have autonomy and ownership over what they're doing, which is really nice. Yeah, which builds self-esteem and so many other things. Mm. Do you have an age limit for what age young people can work with you? When I joined Hands On about three years ago, a little over three years ago, it was really mostly 18 and up. And we tried to understand why that was. And there wasn't necessarily an intentional effort to change that. We typically say five and six and up is a good age for certain programs like interacting with elderly or doing an environmental program. But at that age, they still need their parents to watch them. And so 
it can't be maybe a program where we are taking a group of young people with disabilities in wheelchairs who really need the volunteers focused on them, actually physically moving them. So we really have to look at the nature of the program. And that's where the opportunity for creating family events comes in as well. Bring your younger children for the beach cleanup and things like that. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yep. When did you first get involved in social causes and global issues and things like that? When did that become an interest of yours? You know, it goes back to my childhood. And in high school, I probably was instilled a sense of service through different school programs. I even got a small college scholarship for community service. Did you? Yeah. And you're American. I'm American. It was given to me by McDonald's. Of course, my friends teased me that it was payback (laughs) for all the fries I ate in high school. But (laughs) it actually was a community service award, which was a lovely thing to be able to do. So it started back then not as anything, you know, official. It just organically happened. You know, in university, you know, with my sorority, I was part of the group that did the community service. So it's sort of always been part of my life. Coincidentally enough, when I was in my 20s living in Chicago, I was a volunteer for an organization called Chicago Cares. Today, Chicago Cares is an affiliate of Hands On Hong Kong. Oh, that's really cool. So it's just sort of this cross world coincidence connection. And then when I lived in India, in Mumbai for seven years, I think volunteering and community service, the need is right in your face. You can't not want to do something because there is such need on your doorstep. So whether it's just having something to, you know, giving out school supplies to children on the street or a banana or a biscuit or going to help at an elderly center, whatever it is, that was all readily available in Mumbai. And then when I came to Hong Kong, I remember thinking, I wish there was a Chicago Cares, like, you know, a Hong Kong Cares, like that one I volunteered with years ago. And sure enough, not long after, our founder of Hands on Hong Kong started Hands on Hong Kong. And I read about it. And a friend of mine said to me, hey, someone's done it. Because I had thought, oh, maybe I'll start that. And someone beat me to it. So it's a lovely serendipitous occasion that when, you know, when I took over the role here, that it was something that kind of felt like a lot of roads were leading to this. How did you decide to change your career to make this your actual focus and your full career rather than something that you did on the side? Yep. I kind of had to give myself permission to leave my old job because it was a job that I absolutely loved. What were you doing? Can yes, you remember? I was working for The Economist magazine and for a while was looking after events and conferences for Asia. And then in my last couple of years there, looking after sort of big global initiatives and global events. So it was an exciting role. It was a career pinnacle at the time. And so how do you leave something like yeah. that? People would say to me, how did you leave that yeah. job? Because How was... did you? Because what a great job. And that must have been so interesting and diverse and fulfilling. And it was. And I'm so grateful for it. I was there for 10 years. So that's why I say I had to give myself permission because I was really torn in terms of how could I leave a job that I love so much and that I believe in so much. And, you know, I had a wonderful hand in helping to decide and create the global initiatives that we were going to focus on, ocean sustainability. LGBT equality, food security, whatever it might be. But there was also this pulling at me that I've always wanted to run an NGO. And I've always felt that someday I would. And it was a someday, someday, someday. So was it a bit of a lifelong dream? It was. It really was. That's great. And I'm glad to say it didn't let me down. Because it would, that would have been a bummer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you hated it. <laughs> right. But, and we're filled with regret. <laughs> it, yeah, it's true. But, you know, it's yeah. funny. You talk to people who have gone sort of from the corporate world to running an NGO. And there is a bit of a stigma attached to that because, you know, just because you maybe you've been a banker or a lawyer or run events for The Economist, what do you know about running an NGO is sort of the thought because there are other people who come up through the NGO world who are experts at things. But you've got to be bringing a skill set with you from the work that you've done and you can then adapt it. And as women, we're very good at that. We are very good. (laughs) It's transferable skills. Yes, that's it. (laughs) So, you know, but I think hands-on was the right one for me. Would I be able to go run, you know, an organization specific thing around women's health? No, I'm not trained in that. But hands-on is about mobilizing people. Yes. And you were in events management initially. So you're really using the same skill set for a different purpose. That's exactly right. Mobilizing people to get, you know, come around a common theme like ocean sustainability or mobilizing people to get out and volunteer. It is. It's the same skill sets. And I also firmly believe that the NGO sector benefits from having more and diverse 
different types of skills brought into it. You know, diversity is the key to everything, I think, when you've got great, you know, different mindsets and perspectives coming around to solve a problem. I think it's overall a great thing for the sector to have more people coming in. Absolutely. And so can you identify some of the key skills that you bring to the table in this area that really are something that are very, very helpful and useful in your role? Yeah, I think for my role as an executive director, certainly strategic planning and thinking ahead is critical. So I'm often talking to my team about the fact that I really need them focusing on right now and this year. And if I'm doing that, then I'm not thinking about next year or the year after. And so my head really needs to be in developing a plan that makes sense for the organization and obviously working with the board and getting their input, but then being able to clearly articulate and communicate what our strategy is and how that translates into practical reality and what our actual programs will be and where our focus needs to be. So I think definitely strategy and being able to turn that into execution is number one. Yeah. And are you uh, responsible for funding? And as an NGO, do you have to rely on big corporations in Hong Kong to fund your programs? Yeah, we're in a unique situation in that we provide a service to corporates that is valuable and that they pay for. So that funds a portion of the work we do. Can you explain to me what you mean? What service do you provide (laughs) for corporates? While on the public side, we have up to 200 volunteer activities every month that anyone you know could just go and sign up for and it's free. For corporates, they will come to us and say, we would like to have monthly volunteer activities for our staff or quarterly or maybe one big activity a year for 500 people. And we work with them to get a brief and refine that brief, understand what might be their social responsibility goals. Are there any sustainable development goals that they're focusing on? And then we will develop programs for them that are meaningful, that serve a community need, but they're also engaging and fun for the volunteers. So as part of that, we charge them a fee for the activity itself, but then we very transparently add on a donation and we say, your donation, that's usually 20% above, that's going to help us run our calendar. So it is actually sort of a fundraising mechanism, but it's actually through providing a service that they are looking for. And that's so interesting, isn't it? Because corporations, I think in the last maybe 10 to 20 years, have really started to develop that social conscience. And they've started to look at ways that they can give back to the community and making a difference. I don't think it was something that was really focused on 10 or 20 years ago. Do you agree? I do agree. And I would say in Hong Kong, it's only growing. So we have a number of global multinationals who maybe they have sort of a global mandate that everyone in, you know, who works for XYZ company on this day will be doing volunteering around the world. And that was sort of where, at least when I joined the organization, that's what I saw more so was the global companies who had a policy around the world. But what's really exciting to see is more and more local companies and small and medium companies who may not even have a person on their staff whose day job is being head of sustainability or corporate social responsibility. Often it's someone who's accountant by day, but has a strong passion for service and volunteering. And there might be a few people who join a committee. And it's in addition to their regular day jobs. And then those are the companies, I think, where we can really make a difference because we bring to them a whole wealth of knowledge on community needs, who the different NGOs are, where volunteers could really make a difference. And so we kind of do the legwork for them and we become an extension of that committee. And then we can come in and actually run the programs for them. Brilliant. So that makes complete sense. Yes, it does. It does. Tell me what are some of the key community needs? So you said you talked about homelessness and poverty. What are some of the other needs within the local Hong Kong community? In Hong Kong, our children and youth are actually living one in four under the poverty line. And so one in four aren't getting three square meals a day. We've got children living in some of those really tiny flats who don't have a desk to sit at and do their homework. So that's an issue. But with some other groups who are a little bit more specific, refugees and asylum seekers live really on the brink of destitution in Hong Kong. And so children and students of refugee families have very little. You know, we are often trying to provide programs, weekend homework help and stimulation So refugees and asylum seekers, ethnic minority students, we find in Hong Kong that there are a number of groups that have been living in Hong Kong for generations. 
And they, particularly from South Asia, and their families have a difficult time breaking that poverty cycle because they're typically in menial jobs. And what we find is that language barriers and just sometimes prejudices can cause that. So those students, you know, we're trying to find ways to provide language support so that they can become more mainstream in the education system. Without migrant workers, Hong Kong ceases to work. And so a number of particularly domestic helpers are abused. The statistics, which I think are significantly under represent, they say one in five are victims of at least verbal abuse, sometimes physical or sexual, but much of it goes unreported for fear of any kind of backlash. Beyond that, we have, of course, you know, our elderly are just the proportion of people who are falling into the 65 and above category, but also below the poverty line is exponentially growing. So a changing need in Hong Kong, so these are all not changing needs, but what might be evolving is that with this changing demographic in Hong Kong, there are more needs for carers. So you mean with for the aging population? That's exactly okay. right. Yep. And so what we've just been learning more about is that with the growing need for carers, the carers themselves are having more needs. So this is Because something... it's a big job. It's hard, isn't it? It's emotionally and physically very taxing to be a carer. That's exactly right. And there aren't really a lot of organizations and people looking after the carers. So I could see that being an expanding area. Another area, so Hong Kong is home to thousands of people with disabilities of different kinds. They might be sort of special education needs or some kind of physical support that they need extra. So one of the other areas that I know, the Hong Kong Council of Social Service has put a report to the Social Welfare Department saying we need more support and more programs in skills training for people with disabilities. So skills training that will help may allow for people with any kind of disability to be more economically active, be a contributing member of the workforce, because disproportionately they're not in the workforce. Skills training overall is a need. Women, single working moms from low-income backgrounds, we're looking for ways to actually provide more financial literacy, career coaching, to be able to uplift women to take more control of their future paths. You've just covered a small amount, I'm sure, of what's going on in Hong Kong, but it just makes you realize that as an individual, you need to kind of think about what are you passionate about? What do you care about? What moves you? And then that's the area you can go and give back to. And how can people do that? Like literally, what can our listeners do? So I would start with handsonhongkong.org slash calendar. It's the easiest place to look, but we're not the only platform. There are other platforms out there. There's Social Career, there's Meetup, there's AVS. So there are plenty. There's plenty of need in Hong Kong, and we can't possibly all cover it all. But a great place we say to start would, of course, be our calendar and just have a scroll through, see. Sometimes it's what fits your schedule. Of course, what fits your interest and your talent, but what fits your schedule may be a practical place to start and try different things. There's no time requirement. So you could try doing a program that maybe is tutoring students one afternoon. Another day you might be doing cleaning up a trail. Another day you might work with cats. You know, it's just whatever your interest is, we've got programs just to help meet that. But I would also say if you have a particular talent that you'd like to put to use, if you're a photographer, if you're a gardener, if you have great accounting skills or web design or social media, nonprofits are looking for that as well. So there are a lot of different ways to put your time and talent to really good work. Awesome. So that's a lot of great tips. You talked a little bit earlier about sustainable development goals. Does Hands On Hong Kong have a focus on particular sustainable development goals? Obviously, poverty is one of them. Yep. <laughs> what about some of the others? In a way, we actually really do cover them all. Interestingly, the partnerships may be, which is number 17, may even be the one that represents us the most because Everything we do, we do by bringing people together. We sort of are all about collaboration and connection. You're the catalyst to bring all of these organizations together and link the volunteers with the need. That's exactly right. Because the need across all 17 goals, if there's an organization in Hong Kong that represents it, we'll partner with them. So we kind of cover them all. So I think partnership is the one that best reflects our work. Okay, that makes sense. That's awesome. Could you tell me a little bit about 
the way that you feel that we can get the word out to people in Hong Kong and make them understand that it's not just this glitzy, glamorous, rich city where everybody is able to have a job and, you know, we don't really know much about unemployment and poverty and things like that. So how can we get the message out more, apart from like doing podcasts like this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. We are right aligned with you on that because our monthly newsletter, every single month, we will cover a different issue. So the plight of refugees. This month, we're talking about women. Last month, we were talking about education. So we're really trying to, we say it's hard to empower people and inspire them to volunteer if they're not educated about the issues first. So really trying to spotlight different issues to let people know what the issue is to begin with, and then also highlight a program where if that piques their interest, they can go and see that. So I would encourage your listeners to really all of our newsletters are on our website, but help us to share because once someone tries a volunteer activity, they're very likely to go back again. Studies have shown they're three times as likely to go back and volunteer again Why once they've done that, it first. Do you think? We actually did some research on this with Nielsen. They did a pro bono study for us. And when people were asked, do you have an interest in volunteering? More than 70% said yes. When later in the survey, they were asked, have you volunteered in the last 12 months? It was around a fourth actually had. What was holding them back? Obviously time. But the second thing was not understanding the impact they might have. You know, there's sort of this impression that, oh, I'm just going to give two or three hours of my time. How can that really make a difference in someone's life? But once they go and they have that connection and they even feel the impact on themselves, which really is equal, if not greater than the impact they may be having on someone else's life in some ways, that feel good factor makes them want to come back. And they actually also realize, hey, I can make a difference. You know, if you go to something like one of our community kitchen partners or food waste management or food redistribution partners, and you stand and sort bags of rice for two hours, but then you see, oh, this is going out on these pallets to these organizations, or you chop vegetables for two hours and you realize, oh, that's going to go into a soup that's going to be served to these elderly who are coming in now. When you can actually realize how little it takes to make a difference, it fuels you to say, I want to do it again. Can you think of an anecdotal story about how some of the work that you've done has an impact on an individual in a positive way? I'm sure there's loads of different stories that you have. Think of any one. There are many stories that we have and letters from NGO partners and teachers I could actually really cover this from two perspectives. So one is an impact on a recipient of one of our volunteer programs, and one would be on the volunteer. The recipient, so we ran in 2018 a whole series of skills workshops for young adults with mild intellectual disabilities or mild special education needs. And previously, some of the programs we had run had been more in helping to prepare them for roles maybe at restaurants, some sort of food service. But we wanted to step it up a notch. And so we were connected with a, an organization called Sensational, and they ran a 10-week course that was office training. So we had students come through from the Poland Cook and from the Nesbitt Center. And the students were taught things like how to set up a meeting, paper, shredding, copying, faxing, you know, just sort of general delivering mail, but also things like office etiquette, dressing, grooming, and greeting. So different things. And we had some graduates come out, 18 graduates come out of that class. And we thought, well, that's great. And that's wonderful in itself. But what if we could actually find jobs for them? And so this wasn't a requirement of the program, but one of our team members, our associate director, Catherine, she really took this program to heart and went out and talked to different companies and said, look, we've got these graduates. They're skilled and ready. Why not give them a try? And so we have a lovely graduate named Harbor who's working at Robert Walters every Friday since last March. He is there. He reports to the tea lady in the office. And his job is delivering the mail, setting up meetings, and you know, keeping the pantry tidy and doing other things. But what has been so amazing is that Harbor and his family have been transformed. He is gainfully employed with this job. But what we've heard is that everyone in the office has been transformed because Harbor's presence brings just such joy to the office that they just celebrated his six-month anniversary there and gave him 
a T-shirt and some gifts. And people were crying. Harbor was crying. They sent us a video of it. It was oh, phenomenal. That's so awesome. That's, Isn't that brilliant? And through that training and then also, I guess, you approach some companies to see if they will then employ these young people who have got these skills that they yes. normally wouldn't consider. No. So isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful. And we're holding them up as an example, hoping that other companies will hire. And we also have White and Case hired another one of our graduates named Ming, and he started in September. So wow, that's we've now amazing. got two stories. Any corporations out there listening in Hong Kong, get in touch with Hands on Hong Kong and employ one of these young people who have been trained and they'll be able to work somewhere in your organization. And it also it will just make such a difference to them and their family and your own business. And the staff the at the company, with. exactly. Yeah. They'll transform them. Yes. Isn't that great? Tell me a bit about what a servathon is. Servathon. So that is a week long service marathon where there is no running, just serving. So this is something that we brought to Hong Kong. Many other markets have a servathon and we started it in 2017. So we're going into our fourth year next year. We love servathon because it helps to create awareness around the importance of community service. So it runs in May. And what we do is it's basically what Hands on Hong Kong does all year round, but on steroids for one week. Is it like 24 hours a day kind of thing and people change in and out? It's every day constantly. Right. So there is time for sleeping, but because we partner with, you know, the SCMP and we partner with the MTR Corporation and others to help us spread the word, it's a moment in time where everyone unites and we get a lot of visibility for Servathon. We purposely made Servathon the hero, not hands-on, because we really wanted it to be something that all of our NGO partners would embrace because the message is get out and volunteer. It doesn't matter if you volunteer with us or someone else or directly with one of our partners, just get out and serve. And so it's an opportunity for people to learn more about the needs of Hong Kong, try their hand at different volunteer activities. It's sort of an entry level as well for corporates who maybe haven't done a lot of volunteering, but at least they know once a year they can send out a team during Servathon It'll be fun. And they're joining a whole community initiative. That sounds great. Do you have schools involved as well? We do. Oh, see, we, we need to get our school involved absolutely. in that. Yes. For sure. That would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah. What are the, some of the qualities that a volunteer might need to have, personal qualities? I really think the only quality that's needed is empathy. That's I thought what, you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. It really is. And, you know, I even attended a workshop for nonprofit leaders and I was trying to decide about you know, what qualifications were even needed for a staff member at Hands On. And everyone around me said, do you need more than empathy to develop a program? I mean, of course, it helps to have experience and skills. But to me, empathy is the answer to it all. Because if you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, you can understand what they need. You can understand how to deliver a service. And it's even empathy for the volunteer, understanding, you know, we're often a bridge between the needs and those that have the ability to give the time and the support. So we're trying to really educate both sides on what are the needs of the NGO so that the volunteer, whether they're from a corporate or an individual or a school, they have empathy for the needs of the NGO. But often we're also trying to ensure that our NGO partners understand some of the restrictions that a volunteer might have on their time or a corporate might have on getting approval process, you know, that there are limitations sometimes on both sides. And so we're trying to bridge that gap and translate the two different languages for one another. And do you think that people can learn empathy or do you think it's innate? I think you can definitely learn empathy by putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Sometimes people maybe have it more naturally, but tell me if you go on a kindness walk and you don't feel something for people who are living on the street, if you before thought, oh, why can't people help themselves? And then you go and you realize, oh, 60% of the people living on the street actually have a job, but they have been displaced or they're earning so little. They might be someone who's, you know, you see a lot of elderly people pushing those carts up the street with cardboard boxes on them. Those are people who are getting paid so little. Often they are living on the street. Because mm, so, rents are so expensive yeah. in Hong Kong. It's ridiculous. It is. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Tell me what you are most grateful for in your life. Yes. Beyond the obvious my family, my friends, my work. I would say it's the choice 
that I've been given in life. I have been able to choose to study a certain path, to accept certain jobs, to live in different cities, to choose friends, to choose jobs, really. I was grateful to get the opportunity to work at Hands On, but it was my choice. I do believe that when you're born into certain circumstances that afford you choice in life, it's incredibly fortunate because not everyone is given that. And so I'm grateful to have that. Yeah, I am too. I agree. Would you change anything in your life? (laughs) Do you have any regrets? Really, I'm a firm believer in that people typically regret the things they didn't do, not the things they did. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, very profound. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I've done has brought me to where I am. I'm really grateful to where, where I am today. Changing anything, you know, I miss loved ones who have passed and I wish they were here. I wish I could spend more time with loved ones who are living far away. And that's probably the tricky part of having a wonderful and exciting life for you. You live in a different country and you learn about different cultures and all of that is incredibly fulfilling, but it obviously takes you away from other people who are close to you. So, you know, it's two sides of one coin. I'm so grateful for the relationships I've made, friends I've made, colleagues and people over here on this side of the world. Yes. But, but I certainly we all miss, miss our others. families. Yes, yeah. Exactly. That's something about being an expat, isn't it? For sure. Yeah. It's probably one of the most difficult parts of yeah. being an expat, but It's that give and take. You've got to let go of something to gain some other richness in your soul. That's right. Yeah. And I feel blessed that my parents were the type that really gave me wings and said, you can do anything and you can go anywhere and you can be anything you want. Yeah. And so I remind my mother, this is her fault. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Do you have children? I have a 16-year-old son. All right. So are you the same with him, like just encouraging him to be whoever he wants to be and to spread his wings? I hope so. It's funny, though. My husband and I, we love travel. We take our son everywhere and, you know, hopefully give him lots of opportunities, expose him to many different sides of life. Just recently, we were in an elephant sanctuary in Thailand where we were working with the elephants, no riding. It was all about helping to support those that had been rescued. But it's funny because my husband and I say we've probably ruined him because I think all he wants to do is have a job where he stays put. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't want to give back anymore because he's done he's so done. much as a child. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any advice for parents out there? Any tips that you would give? What makes a good parent? I don't know if I'm going to be giving that kind of advice. Because my son is 16, I am actually going through a transition because, you know, your kids need you. In- I think the thing is, yes, we as mothers have to prepare for our children to fly the coop. And as they get older, they need us less and less. And they become more and more independent. And that's hard. And that is hard. I think as a parent, we have to prepare for our kids to need us in different ways at different times. So we have to be flexible. We have to evolve. You know, when, you know, just a few years ago, and my son will kill me if he hears this, but, you know, it was, oh, don't leave mom. Stay here. Let's lie down and chit chat in bed. And then, you know, not long after, he's saying goodbye to me in his deep voice. Good night, mommy. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's tucking <laughs> me in and going yeah, to bed. Yeah. And so that's difficult to keep up with and, and see that evolving change. But I think as my sister very wisely said to me when I complain about my son doesn't need me anymore, you know, she says, nobody wants a 30-year-old living in their basement. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. You need to empower them so they can fly out yes. into the world. And it just comes that. around so quickly, doesn't it? And You do have to prepare for that. I remember going to therapy to prepare. I had counseling before my daughter left for university because she was an only child as well. And I was on my own, so I didn't have a partner either. So I think that makes it even harder. Like it was just me and her and then she had to go. So I think preparing myself for that was a really wise thing to do. So I was able to cope when she did go. That was smart. But I think for any parent, whether you have two or three and a partner or whatever, it's still difficult when they grow up because it happens so quickly. Yeah. It's like yesterday they were little and now whoa, they're gone. Yes. I mean, my daughter's 30. It's like, what? How did that happen? And how great that you're working together yeah, now. Yeah, I, I know. Love that. That's brilliant. What yeah. a privilege. Yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So, yeah, it's Maybe brilliant. someday I'll work with my son. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I did have a dress rehearsal because he went away to Hangzhou. He goes to Chinese International School and they have their one year abroad in Hangzhou. Oh, do they? I didn't yes, know that. They're, what a cool thing. Yeah, it is cool. It'd be sort of their freshman so year. So he's just over the border. He's not too far away, exactly. but he's gone. Yeah. Oh. yeah, but he's back now. That was last year. Did he enjoy that? He loved it. I think he loved the sense of independence. He loved living with classmates and friends and having such accessibility to friends. And isn't that nice for you that you did get a little dress rehearsal? So now you, when he goes to uni, you've had that one year, so you know that you can do it. Yeah, I'll be in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing. 
Therapy is very wise yes. for everyone. Agree. So what are your hopes for the future of Hong Kong, Sue? My hopes for the future of Hong Kong are varied and deep and wide. Hong Kong is such a special place. And taking the current situation aside, because I pray for healing and for a positive way forward in the immediate. For the long term, I certainly would like choice for people in Hong Kong to be able to feel that they have a say in their future. I would also love to be able to see a community where more people are giving their time to help others because there is so much wealth. There are so many wonderfully helping hands out there that if everyone kind of just took a personal responsibility for others, so much of the community could be lifted up as well. Absolutely. So we're going to finish up now. Thank you so much for coming to talk to me today. It's been fantastic and so interesting. I'm going to ask you four secret questions that I'm going to put on my Patreon page. And if my listeners want to sponsor me for as little as one US dollar a month, they can go on the page and listen to your answers to my four secret questions. So if you could just give me four numbers from one to 50, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Three, 10, 16, and 33. Okay, great. So we're going to do that. Sue, thank you so much. And if people want to volunteer for Hands on Hong Kong, how can they do that? It's very easy. www.handsonhongkong.org and check out our calendar. The first way to go. Awesome. So thank you so much for this amazing interview. It's been fantastic. And for my listeners who want to hear more of the four secret questions, please go to Patreon. Thank you, Sue. Thank you so much, Jules. My pleasure. Hi Confidants, I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.